Thank you, Seth. It's very gracious. I was nervous. <laughs> Good morning. We're in Psalm chapter 57. Please turn with me. Psalm chapter 57, Psalm of David. The title, For the choir director set to al Sheth, a miktam of David when he fled from Saul in the cave. Be gracious to me, O God, be gracious to me, for my soul takes refuge in you, and in the shadow of your wings I will take refuge until destruction passes by. I will cry to God most high, to God who accomplishes all things for me, and he will send from heaven and save me. He reproaches him who tramples upon me, Selah. God will send forth his loving kindness and his truth. My soul is among lions. I must lie among those who breathe forth fire. Even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue is a sharp sword. Be exalted among the heavens, O God. Let your glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed low, uh, was bowed down. They dig a pit before me. They themselves have fallen into the midst of it. Selah. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing, yes, I will sing praises. Awake my glory. Awake harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O God, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. For your loving kindness is great to the heavens and your truth to the clouds. Be exalted above the heavens, O God. Let your glory be above all the earth. This is the word of God. Let's go to him in prayer that he would feed us this morning. Duck and cover, depending on your generation, these words may bring back some memories. In 1949, the Soviet Union tested its first nuclear bomb, and the United States lost its standing as the only nation with nuclear capabilities. The Cold War began, and with that, so did the fears of the nation. To educate Americans on nuclear preparedness, the Civil Defense initiated Alert America. Duck and cover was the mantra. Bert the turtle was the mascot. <laughs> At the height of the Cold War in 1962, during the Cuban Missile Crisis, duck and cover drills were practiced in schools across America. Children were trained to duck and cover under their desks as a refuge in case of a nuclear attack. Would those desks have provided a sufficient refuge to save children's lives in the, midst, in the midst of a nuclear disaster? Thankfully, we didn't have to find that out. The Cuban Missile Crisis came and went, and yet threats of impending calamity still abound. My generation ran tornado drills and fire drills, and during the Cuban Missile Crisis, your generation would have never imagined that your grandchildren would be running active shooter drills in the schools. And we can't help but wonder if a barricaded door will be sufficient refuge and provide safety. King David faced a different crisis when he was required to seek refuge from impending destruction. That's the occasion of Psalm 57. We see the context in the title of the psalm. For a choir director, for the choir director set to Altesheth, a miktam of David, when he fled from Saul in the cave. Altesheth is likely the tune, but the word means destroy not, or do not destroy. There are four destroy not psalms, chapter 57, 58, 59, and then fast forward to chapter 75. Each has a clear declaration of destruction for the wicked, but it has a distinct declaration of special preservation 
for God's people. Both the judgment of God to come and the mercies and loving kindness that the Lord shows his covenant people. You can read about the occasion in 1 Samuel chapter 24. The presently reigning King Saul has chosen 3,000 men of war to to pursue the anointed young David. David had already escaped from King Saul's grasp multiple times. And here, David has 400 men with him. They are highly outnumbered. We find them hiding in the inner recesses of a cave. In 1 Samuel 24, this cave is described in front of the rocks of wild goats, which could be referring to the same cave as 1 Samuel 22, where David and his men hid from the Philistines. And if that's the case, then the cave is the cave of Adullam. And if you take a trip to Israel, as Dan and Chuck and Sarah recently did, you can find these caves today. But if you ask them, they may tell you it's rather difficult to locate. That's the occasion, David fleeing from Saul. For an outline, verses 1 through 5, we see David's prayer. And in verses 6 through 11, we see David's praise. And there's some wonderful poetic beauty in the psalm as David methodically memorializes this specific occasion of his deliverance. The flow of David's prayer works its way into verse 5. And then from verse 6, it works its its way back. The scheme is an ABC, CBA structure. Think of it as looking into a mirror. David's prayer is cast before the Lord in verses 1 through 5. And in verses 6 through 11, we see David's praise for the result of the, that the Lord has accomplished for him. In verse 1, David pleads for mercy. And then in verse 10, we see the Lord provides endless loving kindness. In response to the plea of mercy, he gives endless loving kindness. In verse 2 and 3, we see David crying out to the God Most High in faith with every confidence of deliverance. And then in verses 7 and 9, the response. David's heart is steadfast, and his cries have turned to praises among the nations at the deliverance that the Lord has accomplished for him. In verse 4, David is among a hostile enemy and helpless in and of himself. But in verse 6, the Lord It is the Lord who delivers and brings about a form of justice where the enemy falls into the very pit which they have dug for themselves. And the apex of this mountainous psalm is found in the chorus. It's repeated in verse 5 and then again repeated in verse 11. Like a mountain capped in pure gold, the psalmist declares, Be exalted among the heavens, O God. Let your glory be above all the earth. Truly, our refuge, God's glory. David opens in prayer, Be gracious to me, O God. Be gracious to me, for my soul take ref- takes refuge in you. And in the shadow of your wings, I will take refuge until destruction passes by. He opens with that plea, Be gracious to me, or be merciful to me. In David's repetition, we see his intense urgency. There's no punctuation in Hebrew. David's repetition is the exclamation mark for his plea. Be gracious to me, O be gracious to me. Whereas the King James renders, be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me. This is a prayer of genuine faith grounded in a full dependence a fully dependent relationship with the Lord. It comes from a heart of one who recognizes their own inability and desperate need for salvation, full dependence upon the Lord, a salvation which can be found in nothing else that this world has to offer. No schemes of men, nothing but the sovereign grace of God. It is a soul bowed down to the Lord, 
in full trust and dependence, recognizing that he alone is the only efficient source and effective source of true refuge. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 16, the author writes, Let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It is here where David's soul takes refuge. While David is hiding in the recesses of the cave, his refuge is firmly planted in the cleft of the rock. And David continues, For my soul takes refuge in you, and in the shadow of your wings I will take refuge until destruction passes by. In John Bunyan's allegory, Pilgrim's Progress, the opening scene shows a man who is living in the city of destruction. He is clothed in rags. He has a burden on his back. He has a book in his hand, warning of the coming destruction. And he cries out, what must I do to be saved? Bunyan is pointing the reader to the condition of all mankind. We have no goodness of our own. Even our best deeds are as filthy rags before a righteous and living God. We are burdened with the great weight of our sin and guilt before God. It cannot be removed by any effort of our own. And due unto our sin, we stand guilty before a perfect, righteous, holy God. And his perfect righteousness demands justice. And we will all stand before him one day to give an account for our lives. It is a terrifying thing to fall in the hands of a living God. The pilgrim meets evangelist who points to a gate in the distance that is shining with light. And thus begins a great journey of pilgrim's progress where Christian finds the same refuge where David here is resting in the person and work of the Lord. David takes refuge in the only source of salvation available from the destruction to come. It is the Lord himself. He is a refuge for David. And in the shadow of his wings, he finds refuge. Just as a helpless chick finds refuge under the wings of its mother hen. David uses that imagery. It's a beautiful image. Uh, he uses it often. For example, in Psalm 91, He who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. I will say to the Lord, my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust, it is He who delivers you from the snare of the trapper and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with His pinion and under His wing you may seek refuge. And his faithfulness is a shield and a bulwark. Matthew 23, verse 37, Jesus uses the same imagery as he laments over Jerusalem. Jerusalem, O Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I have wanted to gather you together, gather your children together, the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings and you were unwilling. After a grass fire or a forest fire, there have been stories where a quail or a grouse is found burnt to death, but the chicks are found alive, still hiding under the wings of its mother. Is that not a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did for his own? That he laid down his life on the cross and bore the just penalty for our sin, the full wrath of God, the Father poured upon him, so that all who would look to him, come to him in faith, would find refuge in him and live. This is what David is looking forward to. This is where David's rest, this is where David rests his faith. And he knows with every confidence that because he is under the shadow of the Lord's almighty wings, that any threat of destruction will soon pass by. He is secure. He is eternally secure in the Lord. 
David can pray with such confidence as we see here because he knows the one to whom he is praying. Verse 2, I will cry to God most high, to God who accomplishes all things for me. David knows the nature and character of God. He is God most high. This is the name above every name. With great reverence, we see here that David holds for the Lord. He is God most high. He is above all things, for he is the creator of all things. Indeed, all things have been created through him and for him. And he is before all things and in all things, and in him all things are held together. That's Colossians chapter 1, verse 17, pointing us to the Lord Jesus Christ, God the Son. He is, self -ex he is omniscient. He is omnipotent. That is, he is all-knowing and all-powerful. He is self-existent and self-sufficient. He is never, he never changes. Never changes. The same God that David worships here is the same God that we worship here today. And because he is God most high, he alone is able to accomplish all things for David. He knows this because he has seen the faithfulness of God in his own life, time after time. It was the God most high who delivered David from the bear. The God most high delivered him from the lion, from Goliath, from the Philistines, and multiple times already from King Saul himself. He accomplishes all things for his people, for those who find refuge in him, to those who he has called to himself. Remember, David did not seek God, did he? It was the Lord that pursued David and anointed him. And so David is secure. And in all these circumstances, David knows it is the Lord who accomplishes all things for him. Truly, salvation is of the Lord. This is true in the life of every saint throughout the ages, and equally true, this principle is for us as followers of Christ today. And we need to remember that. We need to remember that in the midst of divine circumstances in our life, He is working all things. As William Cooper wrote, Judge not the Lord by feeble sense. But trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. That's Romans 8, 28, is it not? And we know that God causes all things to work for good, for those who love God, for those who are called according to his purposes. This is the confidence of David, the one who accomplishes all things for him. The word here accomplishes can be rendered completes or finishes, performs, or even perfects. Paul writes in Philippians 1, 6, For I am confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it or perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. I like how one commentator put it here. God's favors, plural, already received are a pledge that he will complete his work of love upon me. The beginning is the earnest of the completion. His word is a guarantee for the performance of all things for me that I need. Now David shifts his prayer with anticipation of how God will deliver and accomplish all things for him. The Lord accomplishes and works in mysterious and inexplicable ways, indeed in miraculous ways. Verse 3, he will send from heaven and save me. He reproaches him who tramples upon me, Selah. He will send forth his loving kindness and his truth. That's how he accomplishes all things for his people. First, he, he will send from heaven and save. He will send his loving kindness and his truth. The God most high here 
is not a distant God that remains hidden in the heights. No, he condescends and stoops low to intervene on behalf of all who call upon him in faith. For his people, he condescends to guide, to lead, to protect, to rescue his people, and to ultimately save. In the midst of danger, and in the midst of hardship, in the midst of various trials of life, the God Most High is not a distant God, but a deeply personal God. And he abides with his people. And he goes before them. And he walks with them. David's faith and trust on the Lord is not merely based off an intellectual knowledge about God. One could earn multiple doctorates in a theology and not know God at all. One can know a lot about God and not, not even cl be close to knowing him. David's walk with God is not grounded in a mere head knowledge, nor is it based on tradition or endless ceremony, but it is an abiding walk with the intimate relationship with God. David knows his rescue is assured because he knows the very one who will send from heaven to save. Just as God has done for him in the past, David is confident in his future. His future is in the Lord, who will send forth his loving kindness and his truth. He has every confidence in this, even in the midst of the most dire circumstance, even in the midst of his enemies that seek his life. Verse 4, my soul is among lions. I must wait. I must lie among those who breathe forth fire. Even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and, sparrows and, and arrows and their tongue a sharp sword. Younger men here, I, I'd like you to consider David for a moment. At this time of the event, David is but in his 20s. He is anointed king, but the, his coronation as king isn't until he's age 30. And here we see young David standing bold and courageous in the face of pressure. He rests in the Lord and in the promises of his word. And even while surrounded by enemies who threaten his life, who breathe fire against him and revile him. Here we may not have men today hunting us down. As followers of Christ, though, you can be sure that you are a target. Each one of you in Christ are a target. And we are immersed in a society that reviles the Lord God in every way that they reviled him then. In fact, this is a perfect, uh, uh, this is a picture of every society since the fall of Adam. Natural man is at enmity with him, with God, hostile against God, against his word and against his people. This is a consistent picture of the nature of fallen man throughout the scriptures. It is the doctrine of total depravity or total inability. Romans 8, 7, the mind set on fle the flesh is hostile towards God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, nor is it even able to do so. You'll remember 1 Corinthians 2, 14, but a natural man does not accept the things of God does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. And he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually appraised. How are we to live as redeemed from that same condition within our context, this context? I think here we see an encouragement in that. David is bold and steadfast. Those who are against David aren't really only against David. They are against the one who anointed David. So you can say that even though they are reviling David, they are, re they are really reviling the Lord who has chosen David as the anointed one. Yet David remained bold and confident in the Lord. He did not waver here. There's an increasing pressure in our own society 
for men and women to bend to the winds of social change, to cultural change. You can be assured as Christian men, you are reviled. And even within American evangelicalism as a whole, largely, there is a trend to promote the feminization of men and to demonize biblical masculinity, pressures to compromise biblical truth in the home and in the church, to compromise faith in the workplace, to bend the knee to the bow to the bales in the Sodoms of our own age. So men and women dare to be a David here. Stonewall Jackson wrote, my religious beliefs or my faith teach me to feel as safe in battle as in bed. God has fixed the time of my death. I do not concern myself with that, but to always be ready whenever it may overtake me. That is the way all men should live and all men would be equally brave. Well, that's David's mindset here. In the midst of all this, he concludes his prayer with a chorus and his ultimate chief aim. Verse 5, Be exalted above the heavens, O God. Let your glory be above all the earth. Universal and global glory to God is what David yearned for here. Not merely his own deliverance, from this trial, not for his own acclaim, but, for, but that God's glory would ultimately be revealed through his circumstances. And his name would be exalted above the heavens and above all the earth. David concludes his prayer with this God-exalting request. And in it we see, not my will, your will be done, your glory made known. Now David shifts from praise, uh, from prayer to praise, and he works his way back poetically. He gave his enemy into God's hands, into his sovereign hands, and now he praises the Lord for the result which God accomplishes for David. Now we work our way back. Verse 6, they have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They dug a pit before me. They themselves have fallen in the midst of it. Selah. In the cave, as David hides from Saul, a rather strange or awkward scene unfolds. Saul, the raging hunter, soon becomes the helpless, vulnerable prey. In the Lord's providence, Saul and his troops have come to the location of the cave. Unbeknownst to him, David and his men were hiding there. Saul needed to take a quick pit stop. Uh, he enters the cave to use the restroom, and there's a prime opportunity for David to take matters into his own hands. But David refuses to raise his hand against the current anointed king, Saul. Rather, he rests that in the hands of the sovereign God. But rather than sneak, he sneaks over and he cuts a piece of Saul's robe. You can read about it in 1 Samuel. David remained humbled and bowed low to the will of God. He did not take matters to his own hands. As one once said, he let the game come to him in the trust of the sovereignty of God. And he trusted in the Lord and the Lord honored him for that. In fact, more than once, David had opportunity to take matters in his own hands with Saul in this cat and mouse game and even slay him on multiple occasions. But the Lord deals with his enemies and the Lord in his own ways unto judgment. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. And in the pit which the wicked dig is the very pit into which they fall in God's just timing, due unto sin. As one put it, evil is a stream which one day flows back to its source. Yet ultimately, there is a fiery pit of God's wrath in which the guilty sinner will be condemned for eternity, lest they be turned by the grace of God through faith unto him. 
We are reminded of that here in this text. The day of destruction is coming. The day of God's wrath draws nearer. With each passing hour, there is only one refuge sufficient to save from the coming destruction of God's justice. Mankind seeks various forms of refuge. Most often in common, the hope is that one's good works is enough, that God will somehow overlook our sins. We like to call them our mistakes, maybe our errors. It is sin before the Lord. Because maybe perhaps our good deeds outnumber our bad ones. Yet it is missed that even our good deeds before men are but filthy rags before God when they are done apart from faith in his anointed one, the Lord Jesus Christ. There are many sources that are viewed as a refuge. I have a co-worker. One is here today and is aware of this story. Uh, one of our co-workers works remotely from Matador, Texas, population 571. As you're aware, an EF3 tornado tore through that small town two weeks ago on June 21st. Tragically, four people were killed, nine injured, and thankfully my co-worker and her family were spared. But she shared a story with our team that came out of that event when the threat of the tornado was realized, one family made their way to the back door to seek refuge in a tornado shelter that was in their backyard. They made it up to their back door, but they found they were too late. The winds were swirling uh, too violently, and then they had to retreat back into the inner recesses of their home. I guess they ducked and covered, and the storm passed, and they emerged safe. But when they examined this tor the tornado shelter, it was completely destroyed. Bricks and rubble had filled it. It was but a rubble. It appeared to be a sufficient shelter, and they had every confidence that it would be. But in the end, it would have been their demise. Miraculously, the Lord spared them from that calamity. And there's a lesson here that I think we should take to heart. It's the lesson of Proverbs 16, verse 25. There is a way that seems right unto a man, but its, way, its end is death. There is but only one refuge sufficient to save. By grace, God answers the cries of all who call upon his name, and he turns their cries into praise. That's where we see David continuing his praise to the Lord for deliverance that the Lord accomplishes for him. His cries in verse 2, now we work back and are turned into worldwide praise. My heart is steadfast, O God. My heart is steadfast. I will sing. Yes, I will sing praises. Awake my glory. Awake harp and lyre. I will awaken the dawn. I will give thanks to you, O Lord, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations. In the midst of this great danger, this trial of danger, David's heart is not wandering. It is not being blown by the storms of circumstance. Rather, it is steadfast. It is fixed. It is stable. It is held fast and firm in the Lord. And notice that the steadfastness of David's heart is counted in double measure and with great emphasis. There's an exclamation there. Indeed, it overflows even to exuberant song and praise to the Lord for the work of his hands. What measure of grace is this that causes the afflicted heart to sing praise and give thanks? It's amazing. It flows from a heart that rests in God's sovereign grace and his divine nature and his character. It rests in the great work of the Lord who has accomplished all things 
for those who trust in him. It is a heart that rests in the gratitude, in gratitude to the Lord for all he has done for us. Psalm 30, verses 3 through 5. O Lord, you have brought up my soul from Sheol. You kept me alive, that I would not go down to the pit. Sing praise to the Lord, you his godly ones, and give thanks to his holy name. For his anger is but for a moment. His favor is for a lifetime. Weeping may last for a night, but shout of joy comes in the morning. My dear friends, those who are in the Lord, the light of the dawn is always before us, always shining ahead of us. God's grace is sufficient and efficient to see us to full completion. For his loving kindness is abounding and immeasurable for all who are in him. That's where David goes in verse 10. For your loving kindness is great to the heavens and your truth to the clouds. It's immeasurable. Verse 1, David prays for mercy and grace. And now we have come full circle. The Lord answers his infinite love, with his infinite loving kindness and lavishes on his covenant people. Psalm 103, 11 through 13, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his loving kindness towards those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far he has removed our transgressions from us. What a refuge we have in him. And how this is to cause his people to praise for those whose refuge is in the Lord. The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Our refuge, God's glory. And that's where we see the psalm conclude in verse 11. Be exalted above the heavens, O God. Let your glory be above the earth. What a magnificent psalm, is it not? But if we leave it at this, merely a psalm of David in his current circumstance, and glean encouragement from this event, then I think we miss the psalm altogether, and we miss the very one to whom David is pointing us towards. This psalm is a laser beam, uh, pointing us to the person and work of the greater David, the son of David, the anointed one with a capital A and a capital O. It's pointing us to the Messiah. Notice, it is the Messiah who was sent from heaven to save us. The one through whom God has accomplished all things for us. The one, with a capital O, who came and dwelt among his very own. But his own received him not, rather they breathed fire against him and reviled and scorned him. This is the anointed one who endured the full depths of the pit of God's wrath upon himself. And on the cross, he made full atonement for the sins of his people, so that all who look to him would find, through faith, would be fully justified before God Most High. Indeed, the psalm points us to the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. And indeed, God has sent forth his loving kindness, and his truth in the person and work of his only begotten Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Is it not the Lord Jesus Christ who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. God demonstrates his own love. That loving kindness is fully demonstrated perfectly for us in this that while we, are, we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The calamity and destruction of God's wrath has been taken away for all who look to him and him alone through faith. It is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And his name will be exalted among the nations, will it not? Exalted above the heavens, 
and his glory above the earth. Friends, that's Philippians chapter 2, 6 through 11, is it not? The great pouring out of Christ who came from heaven and took on flesh. God the Son became fully man, fully God and fully man. He humbled himself as a servant of sinful men, even further to endure the death, endure death, even death on a cross on behalf of sinful men. And he is exalted in his effective work. That work is his exaltation. His exaltation goes further in his bodily resurrection where we see the acceptance of God Most High. God the Father accepted that work and resurrected his Son and exalted him even further in his ascension where he is now seated at the right hand of God the Father. And he is given a name above every name and that the name of Jesus every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to God's glory. That's the, what the psalm is ultimately pointing us toward. That's where we glean the meaning of Psalm 57. We're about to enjoy Independence Day. In the year 1776, it was 98 years after John Bunyan wrote Pilgrim's Progress. And in 1776, John Newton wrote a preface that was widely distributed around the world. He concludes his preface to that book, that allegory, in this way. I think it's an appropriate way to conclude our time together. He writes, if you are living in sin, if you, you are in, if you are living in sin, you are in the city of destruction. Oh, hear the warning voice. Flee from the wrath to come. Pray that the eyes of your mind may be opened and that you may see your danger and gladly follow the shining light of the word till you enter by Christ, the straight gate into the way of salvation. If death surprise you before then, before you get onto this road, you are forever lost. And if you are indeed asking the way of Zion with your face thitherward or your face toward the prize, I bid you good speed. Behold, an open door is set before you which no one can shut. Yet prepare to endure hardship for the way lies through many tribulations. There are hills and valleys to be passed lions and dragons to be met with, but the Lord of the hill will guide and guard his people. Put on the full armor of God. Fight the good fight of faith. <clears throat> Beware the flatterer. Beware the enchanted ground. See the land of Beulah. That is, see the land of marriage. Um, yea, the city of Jerusalem is set before you. There, Jesus, the forerunner, waits to travel, to welcome travelers home. That is sovereign grace, is it not? We look to him, we look to Christ, and we glory in him. May God give us, grant us the grace to look to him as we go from here and rest in, the re in his refuge in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand and sing hymn number one, and then I'll close in the benediction. What can we say, O Lord, to you but thank you for your amazing grace, your sovereign grace fully displayed upon the person and work of your Son, in whom alone is our refuge, in whom and alone is our strength and our guide, our shelter. Thank you, Lord, for your Son. Turn our hearts to you, O Lord. We pray for our people here as they go forth. Grant them mercy, courage, strength, 
in all that they face in this life. Put the light of the dawn ahead of them in your son, that our mind would be fixed and stayed upon thee. And that is where true peace and rest is found, where we glory in you. Lord, we also pray for our nation. We are concerned when we see the direction where we have come now. We pray for revival. You are capable. You are God most high. And the Spirit blows where you lead it. We pray that you would give blessing upon our nation. Bend our knee to you in faith and repentance and bless your people. And now as we go, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance up on, upon you and give you peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.